Welcome to the Shema Podcast, the podcast for the perplexed, where Torah insights intertwine through personal stories as well as interviews with leading Torah scholars demonstrate the empowering qualities of Torah and mitzvot. For more great Torah learning through Torch, the Torah Outreach Center of Houston, go to torchweb.org. Now to the show. So today I want to talk about anti-Semitism. It's a subject that is quite perplexing. And I think something that we should all think through as a people. Imagine that you are in charge of immigration for a nation. And you're trying to identify a group of people that you should provide visas to. A group of people that you think would contribute to your country. Well, the first thing you'd probably consider is, are they law-abiding citizens? You know, for instance, we don't want people who commit murder here. I want to make sure this is a group of people overall that don't have the proclivity to want to murder other people. Now, the Jewish people throughout history, definitely more in the past than present, but throughout history have always been a people that have engaged overall in a study of Torah. And we were given a mitzvah, a commandment, the top 10 at Mount Sinai, the sixth commandment, that thou shalt not murder. But however, that mitzvah, that commandment, has nothing to do with causing someone's life, their body, to cease operating. The Almighty knew that that was too obvious to the Jewish people as they stood at Mount Sinai that they did not need to be instructed about not doing such a thing. So what is that mitzvah referring to? Not humiliating your fellow. And there's a whole myriad of laws on things we learn and study on how to make sure we don't humiliate someone. So obviously a people that are totally concerned and focus everything they do on not humiliating another that gets even practiced by rituals and practices of doing things like covering the challah on Shabbos before we say Kiddush, just so we don't embarrass the bread. I think we could say as someone who is running immigration that we would check the box there for these people are not going to want to commit murder. Great. What about stealing? That's something we also don't want. We don't want people that have the proclivity to steal. Now, the eighth commandment, giving at Mount Sinai, says thou shall not steal, but that's not even referring to taking someone's property. It involves the mitzvot around kidnapping, human trafficking. So what does the Almighty tell us with regard to stealing? It's really addressed in the 10th commandment, to not even be envious of what someone else has. So as far as being law-abiding citizens, I think we would check the boxes in all these areas. What about whether it's a people that are going to contribute to the economic output of the country? Well, again, we've been a people that have been very involved in Torah study, very educated, very successful in business overall. I mean, the Torah tells us everything we need to know to be successful in business. So wherever we go throughout the millennia, whenever we ended up in a country, we prospered financially. And there are, of course, those that are become destitute, the widows, the orphans. And the Torah tells us that we are obligated to give 10% of our money to support the poor and needy. And the Almighty warns us that that 10%, that is what that is designated for. And if you fail to be a good fiduciary over those assets and give those to those in need, then I'm going to take your money away. So we've always been a society where we've cared for the orphans, for the widows, for those that were in need. So as you can see, when you look at the Jewish people, you wonder, where would anti-Semitism come from? It is the most irrational thing that has ever existed. There's no way to explain it. And then if you look at some other facts that we know, the first commandment given to Mount Sinai is that I am Hashem or God, I took you out of the land of Egypt. Basically, God commanding us to know the aspect of him that cares for us, that want a relationship with us. And then we we say in the Shema, the first line, that God who is Elohim, the one that created the world and the heavenly world and this world, and Hashem, the aspect of God that interacts with us on a personal level, cares for us, is intimately involved in everything happening in the world, that that is one. And for a Jew to say, I only believe in Elohim, I only believe in a God that created the world, but he's not involved in matters today. What Rabbi Nachman says is that person is basically an atheist. And it's a very similar quote to what Maimonides says. 
that if someone does not know that God is intimately involved in their life, it doesn't matter if they say they believe in God, they're an atheist. Why? Because God is explicitly telling us that if we don't recognize him in all those aspects, then the God we say we believe in doesn't exist. So if God created everything in the world and orchestrates everything, then obviously he has some influence on the creation of this irrational hatred towards the Jewish people. But at the same time, we know that he loves us. We know that he needs the Jewish people. So if he needs us and he loves us, why would he create anti-Semitism? This is something that is strange. It's something that I would like reconciled. It's something that seems unreconcilable. And when I look at anti-Semitic events that have occurred in the recent past, and I look at the most vocal Jewish groups explaining what is happening, the most prominent reason I've heard as of recent is it's because of President Donald Trump. However, I don't recall any policy initiative being signed into law by President Trump and was advocating anti-Semitism. Plus, I know two of his very influential advisors are his daughter and son-in-law that are Orthodox Jews. So I haven't been able to figure that one out. And then I see what the response is of the more vocal Jewish groups on how to combat and get rid of anti-Semitism. I've seen social media campaigns to stop the hate. I've seen the Holocaust Museum start an anti-bullying campaign. But are these things working? Maybe. Maybe it'd be worse without their efforts in these areas. But I decided I wanted to know more. And I wanted to find out, does God through his Torah tell us anything about this? What is anti-Semitism? Why would God allow it? And what can we do to remedy it? So I have asked my beloved teacher, BFF, Rabbi Yokoff will be on to share with us his Torah knowledge on this subject. How are you, Rabbi? It's such an honor and such a pleasure to be back here on the Shema podcast, the podcast for the perplexed. I am honored and weighed down with responsibility of trying to answer those questions. I wasn't sure that we were talking about politics or skills-based immigration before we got here, but I'm happy to roll with the punches. And I think you're right. If uh, I was someone who was in charge of determining who gets a visa and who doesn't, uh, your argument seems pretty sound. The Jews contribute a lot, and they would be uh, worthy candidates of receiving those visas. I totally agree with that assessment. But yet over history, over the thousands and thousands of years, countries do invite us in, and then they kick us out. And it's never in a very pleasant way. It's very odd. Yeah, well, there's no way to look at a retrospective of Jewish history and not be troubled by the fact that it seems like wherever we go and whatever society, culture, nation, people we come in close contact with, invariably there is a component of what we call anti-Semitism or Jew hatred. You go back to the Babylonians and to the Assyrians and to the Greeks and to the Romans, the Byzantines and the Persians and the, the Muslims and, of course, the Crusades and the various different groups of Christians and really, there isn't an example, or almost isn't an example, of a society, of a culture, of a place, of a country that we were in that we did not suffer from some degree of anti-Semitism. Of course, some places we were expelled, like England. Of course, England is today a big hub of Jewish life. But from the year 1290 to, I believe it was 1655, so we're talking about a long time, 350 years, Jews were not allowed to live there. We weren't allowed to live in France, in, in various places all over Europe. They would just expel their Jews. Of course, we know about the Spanish expulsion, the Portuguese expulsion. You know, Jews suffered a lot throughout history. There's the expulsions, like we mentioned, the blood libels, persecution and marginalization of every kind, uh, physically, uh, socially, of course, financially, Jews are not allowed to be, you know, in certain industries, in certain occupations, not allowed to own land. So it does raise a very important question, you know, how is it possible or what's the rationale, what's the reason behind this Jewish suffering and this anti-Semitism that uh, seems to be resistant to any changes. No matter what you change in the situation around us, it seems like anti-Semitism is still present. I would say even in America, 
You know, America is the best country in history for the Jews. I think it's the best. It still has a history and a present of anti-Semitism. Of course, there's the famous episodes, the Leo Frank episodes, you know, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a famous anti-Semitic book, was apparently the second best selling book in the country, after the Bible, of course, for decades. And I actually, before I got on here with you, I looked up the stats from the most recent years that are available from, you know, the Justice Department to the FBI of hate crimes in this country. And of course, we hear about the Islamophobia and how everyone is, you know, hates the Sikhs, uh, people who wear those turbans. Well, it actually turns out Jews are by far and away the biggest victims of hate crimes in this country. Uh, 57% of all religious hate crimes were directed at Jews who comprise a mere, what is it, 2% of the American population. So even today, and even in very advanced countries and economies and societies and cultures, even here at home, we are still recipients of this asymmetric hatred that's directed at us. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a tweet. Did you see this? A tweet from the New York City mayor where he was targeting the Jewish communities who weren't keeping by the social distancing group. And it struck me that you really could say things about Jews in polite society that you cannot say about any other minority community. I always say, you know, this is the test. If you want to know if something's anti-Semitic, just replace your tweet or your statement or your article, your headline. Replace the word Jewish or Israel, right? Replace it with black, right? Just to see how it feels. Just if it feels a little bit iffy, it might be leaning in towards what we'd call uh, uh, anti-Semitism. And by the way, I would surmise that the more religious the Jew is, the more of a fair game target they are. So I think definitely I'm accepting your premise, uh, Dan, that anti-Semitism is real. It appears in every society that the Jewish people are in. And it, and sometimes like today, I would say relative to Jewish history, the pain that we're enduring, at least in America from anti-Semitism, I would say is relatively uh, much more benign, much more mild compared to where it's been in history. Of course, you don't have to go very far back to see the worst genocide in all of human history was perpetrated against our people less than 100 years ago in Germany and really throughout all throughout Europe. So it's still better today, but I think it does really demand an explanation why does this phenomenon of Jew hatred, of anti-Semitism, why do we have it? Why does it exist? And what's the reason behind it? And if we know the reason behind it, maybe we could try to avoid it. That's what we want to find out. So does Torah say anything on this subject? Of course, Torah opines on this. And I think a good way to maybe frame the discussion is to look at what the conventional explanations are. Because this is a question that we're not the first ones to have asked it. Why do people dislike? Why do people hate the Jews? And I think, and you mentioned this, but I think that we could say unambiguously and empirically that this is different than every kind of hatred of the other, of xenophobia that exists. And the reason why is because all the reasons given as to why the Jews are hated really don't stand up to the scrutiny. Some may argue, well, Jews are hated because we killed their Lord and Savior. We committed the worst crime ever. We killed their God, JC. I always make a joke about that, by the way. That, yeah, of course we killed him. And you know what? If he comes back, we'll kill him again. But seriously, you know, we're told throughout history, yes, you killed our God. And on the other hand, oh, by the way, he died for our sins and therefore we're saved. So I always say that we deserve maybe a trophy, not a condemnation for that. You know, where is that? Thank you. I will say I did get the Sunday after Passover. I have a colleague of mine who's not religious, but not non-Jew. And he sent me a text of his beautiful children with their Easter baskets. And he said, my kids are having such an amazing time. Thank you for killing Jesus. So what did you write back to him? Tell them you're welcome. And I'm glad somebody recognizes that they would not be able to experience chocolate bunnies and Easter eggs if we had not done what they claim that we did and killed our Lord and Savior. We are, we're happy to engage in deicides of all kind. 
That's kind of what our nation stands for. Since Abraham, we've been uh, harpooning the deities, the false deities of others. You know, it's not, obviously, it's not just the Christians that hate us. And, you know, we've been told, hey, the Jews are too rich. They own so much real estate. They control it all. And throughout history, the Jews were too poor and we're too downtrodden. Are we too powerful? We control everything. Are we too isolated, too insular? Are we too integrated? Are we helpful? Are we not helpful? Each one of these things have been presented as a reason for anti-Semitism. And of course, there's always going to be outliers, cases where the cause or the alleged cause for anti-Semitism does not exist. It was not present, yet the result was the same, often in quite a virulent and violent way. So, I think the way that I would, at least the, the stepping stone, the basis for the explanation, the way I see it, is as follows. If anti-Semitism is a reality, is a phenomenon that's true, which we agree upon, and if it is unique that it is unlike hatreds or racism or xenophobia that exists to other groups, I think what that says is that there's something unique about our nation. If there is a unique kind of hatred for us, that probably or likely relates to what is, you know, the overarching uniqueness of our people. And if you were to frame the question differently, if you were to ask me, uh, hey, why are Jews different? Or what's different about the Jewish nation? I suspect that the answer to both those questions would lead to the same point. The reason why the hatred to us is unique and the reason why our nation in general is unique, or certainly why we claim it's unique, both of them probably stem from the same source. And I think we have an answer as to why we are unique. We've been saying it for millennia. The Torah writes it. We're the Am HaNivchar. We're the chosen nation. We're the kingdom of priests and holy nation. We're the nation of God. We're representing the Almighty in this world. We have the Almighty's Torah, the creator of heaven and earth. He gave us, our people, and no one else. He gave us his Torah. He gave us the keys to the kingdom. He gave us the mandate and the mission of responsibility to bring the world to its perfection, to fulfill the world's destiny. The Almighty created a world, incomplete, needs some work to be done. And he said, okay, Jewish people, nation of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you are entrusted with the sacred responsibility of getting the job done. That's what we say. And I think in light or in the prism of accepting that principle, that our nation stands for something, and our nation was entrusted by God to accomplish something, not just anything, but the most vital mission in all of mankind's history. The reason why the world was created, the reason why the universe exists, is represented by our people's mission. That's what we say, which is, again, very bold. But I think... Once we accept that, I think it's easier to move on to the next case. Okay, if this nation has this mandate, what else has to be put in place to ensure that they are successful? And I think if we go back to the very beginning of our nation's nationhood and when the mission was laid out, when the Almighty said, okay, there's going to be something called the Jewish nation and they're going to have important responsibilities to accomplish in this world, I think right away there you'll find the clue to the answer. And I'm talking about all the way back to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, it's a nation in its absolute infancy because all we have is Abraham. Abraham doesn't even have any children. And Abraham's told, you're going to be the father of a great nation, a nation that's like the stars, a really powerful one. And you're going to have children, you have the land of Israel, you're going to be my people. Oh, and by the way, you're going to be enslaved. You're going to be tormented. You're going to be oppressed for 400 years. Oh, oh, by the way. And of course, we know the fact that those two, those two clauses, so to speak, those two prophecies are juxtaposed. That, I think, makes a lot of sense in, line, in, in light or in the prism of, of how we're framing this discussion. There's something about our nation that's unique. We have a special mandate. We have a special mission. Oh, and by the way, it's not going to be pleasant necessarily. We're going to suffer specifically at the hands of others, of non-Jews. Anti-Semitism and chosen nation are intimately connected and inextricable, at least according to Torah. Again, there are people, you know, I did a video. Actually, we rewatched it before I spoke to you. In 2015, we did a video series at Torch 
questions for the rabbis, question and answers. And the way this was done is that we had a student of ours. He would ask her question on video. And the question was directed at me. And right after he asked the question, I had to walk up and give an answer. And he refused to give me the question list ahead of time. So I had no idea what he was going to ask until he asked it. But one of the questions that he asked is, why does everyone hate the Jews? Why does anti-Semitism exist? Will we ever have peace with the nations? And that particular video is the most watched video of mine on YouTube. It has almost 15,000 views. And it also has twice as many dislikes as it has likes. What that means is, is that it's a message that people are really interested in, but it's a message that rubs people the wrong way. They're not happy about it. They disagree with it. So I, I think you asked me, Dan, you asked me for what the Torah says. And I believe what I'm going to tell you is what the Torah says, but I am aware that this is not necessarily a popular, maybe not even an inspiring message. I think it is, but I could see how other people don't see it that way as evidenced by the reaction that I've gotten to that particular video. If you want to know what it's called, it's called Why Does Everyone Hate the Jews? I do remember that video. But I say, let's see what Torah has to say because quite frankly, I don't think our infinite creator is concerned about being PC. I think a good place to start, or at least to continue developing this idea, is a teaching of the Talmud in Yevamos, page 63a. And the Talmud here is talking about God's promise to Abraham. He says, I'm going to bless those that bless you. I'm going to curse those that start up with you. And then he tells him that all the blessing that's going to arrive to the world is going to be as a result of Israel. It's an astonishing statement. And the Talmud actually elaborates upon this. And the Talmud says, even the ships that are traveling from Galia to Aspamia, so there's trips, merchant ships that are carrying cargo, nothing to do with the Jewish people. Says the Talmud, even that, the success and or failure of those, those merchant ships hinges upon the Jewish people. You read this, this Talmud, and again, of course, the, the Talmud is, is authoritative on telling us what Torah says. What the Talmud is telling us is that everything that happens in the world, the fulcrum of that is the Jewish people. The world goes up. world economy goes up, it's thanks to us. world economy goes down is implied in the Talmud. It's also thanks to us or as a result of us. What we're saying is that the Jewish people, 0.02% of the world's population, were the people that, that really matter. It's an astonishing statement. And it sounds very boastful and very hubristic. Everything's for us. And I think the answer is, is that, yes, we may be small in number. Our nation, just if, you know, if you look at population, we don't really seem to matter. It's a, it's a tiny blip in the whole population of the world, but we are at the center of the world. And because we're the Almighty's people, everything that happens to the world is a reflection of how the Almighty feels about us. We represent him here. We're chosen to complete a sacred and indispensable mission. We're the nation, we could say. This is harkening back to what we had last time. We're the nation leading the inexorable march towards the Messiah, and therefore everything that's happening is part of that big picture, and everything else, those are the puzzle pieces, but we're the engine, we're the driver, both good and bad, of the world's progress, or sadly we could say, or regression as well. So I think that, like we said, if anti-Semitism exists and it's unique to the nation, then our nation's unique role has to be examined. And again, when the Talmud tells us that everything that happens is a result or a reflection of what the Jewish people are doing and where they're holding kind of a spiritual level, what that means is, is that our nation is the one that's responsible to ensure the world has a bright future and everything else kind of fits into that picture. And whatever the reason for anti-Semitism, that's going to be an extension of why our nation is different and why a nation is responsible, so to speak, for determining the trajectory of the world. So let me tell you what the Talmud says about anti-Semitism. The Talmud says that anti-Semitism is a supernatural phenomenon. And like you said this yourself, there is no logical rationale for anti-Semitism. Everything that we've been told about it that is all excuses, 
That's not the real reason. Talmud tells us there's a supernatural reason for anti-Semitism. And like we said, our nation is unique. Our nation is special. But factors exist that could imperil our nation and our nation's standing. And therefore, what the Talmud tells us, and we'll elaborate about this in a little bit, anti-Semitism is a mechanism to ensure that the nation remains true to its course, true to its mission, and doesn't veer too far off course. It is a guarantee, it is an assurance for Jewish continuity to ensure the Jewish people won't lose what makes them special, despite all the factors existing that deem that result likely to happen. We're Jewish. We stand for something. We are part of a nation of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we can walk around the world proudly bearing the badge of being the Almighty's people and directing the efforts of our lives to try to effectuate the mission that God entrusted us with. But what happens when a Jew says, I don't want to be different. I don't want to be Jewish. I want to be a citizen of the world. I want to be a Frenchman or I want to be a German. I don't want to go back to Israel. I don't want to be part of, you know, what the Jews of yore have said we really stand for. No, I'll, I'll, I'll be part of the Mosaic persuasion, you know. But I'm an American or I'm, I'm a Frenchman. What happens then? What happens when people begin to abandon their Jewish identity, to abandon the mission entrusted to them. What we're told is that when the Almighty tells Abraham, your children are going to be the nation entrusted to fulfill this mission, I am also going to give you the guarantee to make sure they don't get too far off course and there's going to be this mechanism that's going to slap them back onto their tracks. You know, I'll tell you, My grandfather grew up in Germany, in Berlin, and he came from a family that was living in Berlin in the early part of the 1900s. And if you know anything about Jewish history, you know that that was not exactly the location or the time in history where the Jews were sticking to the course of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, I would argue there's no place in history, there's no time in history as in the 19th and early 20th century Germany, where the Jewish people, in the great numbers that they did, began to abandon the tradition and the faith of their past. My grandfather grew up in that world. And, you know, after Hitler rose to power, there was actually a great reawakening that happened in the world of German Jewry. And in fact, his father, my great-grandfather, he was someone that, you know, did drink some of the Kool-Aid of, you know, we're Germans and we're sophisticated and, you know, we're not into the yeshiva and the Talmud stuff. But he also had a great reawakening after Hitler's rise, and he reconnected back to his roots and to his Jewish identity. And it's something kind of remarkable to see this change that happened just in our own family, where, the, you know, the upswing of anti-Semitism actually made the Jews a bit more Jewish. You know, in, in Germany... And in France as well, the 19th century was just a terrible century for Torah, for, you know, for the Jews abandoning Jewish values, Jewish life, Jewish culture. Do you know that, for example, a quarter million Jews in the 19th century actually converted to Christianity, became Christians, because they thought that was their ticket to being accepted in the world around them? So you have this great emancipation of Europe, and the Jews are emancipated. You could... Do whatever you want. You could own land. You could be welcomed to society. You could be welcomed into, into universities. And then the Jews, what do they do? They started dropping religion in numbers and with intensity never seen before in history. And even the prayers were, were modified. We're not going back to Jerusalem. No, Berlin is our Jerusalem. We're good German citizens. We're more German than the most German Gentile. We're com- completely committed to Deutschland, to the fatherland. And in France, by the way, in the 1860s, there were only a small fraction of Jews who remained true to Torah. And you may be surprised to hear this. Some of the quote-unquote shuls, the synagogues in these places actually moved their services, their Shabbos, moved it to Sunday. And... I also heard that not only they move it to Sunday, but they structured the 
synagogue to look very much like a church. Exactly. They tried to make it as indistinguishable as possible, the church from the shul. Services are on Sunday. The rabbis dress like priests, you'd be surprised to hear. And uh, that's why they integrated the organ to into the liturgy, because that would be a way of, you know, of kind of making it more similar to, to the church. And again, this has never happened in history, where so many people, so many communities just abandoned Torah wholesale. And my grandfather used to tell us that in 1844, there was a conference in Brunswick in Germany, a quote-unquote rabbinic conference, where the quote-unquote rabbis repudiated Torah in an official way. They say you don't no longer need to keep Shabbos, you no longer need to keep kosher, you no longer have to marry exclusively Jews. They even, by the way, there was a consideration to disallow, could you imagine? To disallow circumcision. They weren't going to allow circumcision. Why? It's a barbaric ritual of uh, bloodletting. But they wanted to say, ultimately, even for them, that was too, that was too much. But there was a... That's baffling, though, because that's almost like a sect of Christianity that denies J.C. in the New Testament. That's stripping the core out of what made the Jewish people the Jewish people. This is exactly what it was. But there was a young rabbi who was observing this, and he made the following chilling observation. He said, the rabbis in Brunswick have repudiated the Shulchan Aruch, have repudiated the court of Jewish law. There is going to come a time where the Gentiles, they will reestablish the Shulchan Aruch, they will reestablish the court of Jewish law for the Jews. They will foist Torah back upon the Jews. That's what he said in 1844. Of course, we know uh, less than around 90 years later, there's the Nuremberg Laws, where suddenly the Germans themselves say that intermarriage is not okay. They're the, one, they're the ones who once again reinstitute that law. What this is telling us is that there is a certain protective safety measure, safety gap, to ensure that Jews don't veer too far off course. And if they do, they will be pushed back, and sometimes it won't be pleasant. You answered my question from the beginning, which is, if God says he needs the Jewish people to complete creation, and that he allows thing called anti-Semitism that does make sense because if he's needing the Jewish people to be the Jewish people. Yes, and if they veer away from that, they have to become Jewish again, so to speak. Now, the source, or one of the sources for this idea, if you're interested, it's from the Talmud of the book of Shabbos, page 89a. The Talmud is talking about Mount Sinai, of course, the mountain upon which the Jewish people received the Torah, and where that classification, that designation of the Jewish nation was formalized. Now, we're at Sinai, we have this commune with God, this prophecy with God, and now it's official. We are his people. He gave us his Torah. He gave us the keys to do it. So Thomas is trying to figure out the etymology of the word Sinai. Why is it called Mount Sinai? So the first opinion that Talmud initially proposes, because the word Sinai is similar to the word of miracles, namely Nisim. But Thomas says, no, then it shouldn't, shouldn't be called Har Sinai, Mount Sinai. It should be called Har Nisai. So that can't be the answer. So the second answer the Talmud proposes is that it's called Mount Sinai because it's a Siman Tov. It's a good omen. It's a propitious omen for the Jewish people. And Thomas says, no, if so, it should be called not Har Sinai, not Mount Sinai. It should be Har Simnai. And therefore, the Talmud ultimately concludes... The reason why it's called Har Sinai, Mount Sinai, it's the mountain that is related to the word Sina, which means hatred. Har Sinai and Sina, it's the same word, or at least it's similar. It's a similar word. Sina means hatred. The mountain of God, the mountain of Torah, is the mountain upon which hatred of the Gentiles to the Jews was, was unfolded. A shocking statement. The way, again, we would frame that is you cannot have Sinai without Sinna, or at least without the threat of Sinna. Nothing ensures Jewish continuity. Nothing ensures that the mission of Sinai will be perpetuated as a little dose of Sinna, of hatred, here and there in the event that we get too far, of course, and we forget what we accepted at this mountain. 
Would you not describe when we went into Egypt that the Egyptians and Pharaoh, that they, that forcing us into slavery, that was not coming from anti-Semitism. It was just the desire for, to have slave labor. Well, I think that's probably related. You know, if you look at that particular story, Exodus chapter one, of how the Jewish people were initially enslaved, I think it does portend to a lot of the anti-Semitic tropes throughout history. The anti-Semites, some of them sound a little deranged, not because, I guess because they are deranged, some of them, but because they're not speaking logically. And when you laid out the case, I think really eloquently, Jewish people, we contribute, pay our taxes, you know, we're law-abiding citizens, you know, there's very, very low instances of crime. We're good people. Why would anyone hate us? And the answer is, well, you control the banks and you control finance and you're the ones who, right? It, it sounds a little bit crazy, right? So if you look at Pharaoh's justification for the enslavement of the Jewish people, I think it sounds also a little bit crazy. This is uh, verse 8 of, of Exodus. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, this is his pitch. Tell me if this makes sense. Behold, the people, the children of Israel, are more numerous and stronger than we. Okay, you really believe the Jewish people were more numerous and stronger than the Egyptians? Is that what you believe? For sure not. Come, let us uh, outsmart them. We have to outsmart them. We have to, out we have to outfox them. Why? Lest it becomes more numerous than us. And it will be that if a war will occur, it too may join our enemies and wage war against us and go up from the land. There's a whole bunch of contradictions here. Are they more numerous or will they become more numerous? This imaginary war, this hypothetical war, maybe, maybe a war is going to happen. What, 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 are you, what war are you talking about? Oh, and if a war happens, they're going to join our enemies. Oh, and then they're going to leave. So do we want them to stay or do you want them to leave? Do we hate them? Do we love them? I think this is a nice example of the irrationality that lies behind anti-Semitism. It, it, it isn't logical. And the people who profess those beliefs are not making a cogent argument. Now, you're right. That is pre-Sinai. Of course, that's pre-Sinai. But, of course, the mission of the Jewish people is already set into motion, beginning with Abraham. And you did teach me that the slavery in Egypt was likened to a crucible that melts down gold and pulls out the impurities. So it seems like this idea of this external pressure forces us to be more pure, and it seems like maybe there's some common ideas here pre-Mount Sinai and post-Mount Sinai. Yeah, well, it, you're saying because the Egyptian experience will ultimately yield something better, just like the anti-Semitic experience will ultimately yield something better? Is that what you're saying? If it puts that outward pressure on us and refines us, Egyptian slavery trained us to be servants. And then we received Torah, we became servants of the Almighty, and that force continued to exist to keep pressure on us to be the, the servant that carries on Torah. Absolutely. So it is definitely connected. Isn't it interesting that the greatest outbreak of anti-Semitism in history and the worst genocide in history, it happened in the place where the Jewish people were most integrated into general society, and it was the result of people that were the most advanced, the most scientific, the most sophisticated of people in history descended to the worst lows, really, that any man or any people have ever descended to. Maybe that should be the starting point of any discussion on Semitism is to try to rationalize, try to explain how is it possible that Germany, which was arguably the most advanced culture and country in the world, and it was almost definitely the country and culture in the world where the Jews were most integrated, that is the place that sparked the worst outbreak of anti-Semitism. According to the Torah's view, well, in the event or in the location that the Jewish people most immerse themselves or most lose their identity, that's where they're at the greatest risk of provoking an outbreak of anti-Semitism, as unexpected as it may be. When in history was anti-Semitism at its lowest or maybe non-existent? So I think you're right. There's definitely times where it didn't exist. And the answer, I think, the explanation is because, well, if the Jewish nation is doing exactly what they want, then things are going to be great. 
So we know historically that during the times of David and Solomon, it was only 80 years, but that's really the zenith of our nation, where we have peace, we have prosperity, we're connected to Torah, we have righteous leaders, and the entire world wants to convert, they want to become Jewish. They're all looking up to us. They're all admiring us. We're the most model citizens of the world, and everyone is envious of us. And by the way, this is in the Torah. The Torah explicitly talks about this in uh, chapter 28 of Deuteronomy of Devarim. It says, the chapter starts like this, If you obey your God, you faithfully observe his commandments, then the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations. And he talks about all the good stuff that's going to happen to you, all the prosperity. You'll be blessed in the city. You'll be blessed in the country. You'll have progeny. You'll have wealth. Everything will be great for you. If you do have enemies, you'll be able to vanquish them. And then the piece ends. This is, I think, verse 10. And all the peoples of earth shall see that the Lord's name, the Almighty's name, is proclaimed over you, and they shall revere you. There is a way, and we've seen this, again, maybe infrequently, we've seen this throughout history, there is a way for us to be exalted in the eyes of others, to have to command their respect and their admiration, but it is all contingent upon us actually, you know, walking the walk and doing what the Almighty expects of us. But when we abandon that, then we're going to provoke a backlash. Now, I also noticed last week in the Parsha, when it's talking about all the things that we cannot do, this is chapter 18, verse 3. It lists all the abominations that we are not allowed to do. So the verse begins, as the deeds of the land of Egypt that you've lived in. Don't do their deeds. And like the deeds of the people of Canaan that I'm bringing you to, don't do their deeds and don't follow their dicta. So it's telling us that we have to not behave like our Egyptian neighbors and not behave like our Canaanite neighbors. And then it lists all the things that they did, all the bad things that they did. So Rashi tells us that this tells us the fact that the Torah is warning us not to behave like the Egyptians and like the Canaanites, the two neighbors of the Jewish people. This is teaching us that the deeds of the Egyptians and of the Canaanites, they are more corrupt than any other nation. And the place where the Jewish people lived, that was the place that was the most corrupt. The immediate neighbors of the Jewish people were the ones that were the most corrupt. And it even says that there were a bunch of nations in the land of Canaan, and some of them fled. But the ones that stayed, the ones that weren't vanquished, were the worst of the a bunch. So in effect, what this verse is telling us is that the Jewish people are going to be surrounded by scum. We're going to be sur- surrounded by the lowest, most degenerate societies, both in Egypt and, and the land of Canaan. And I think this is a similar idea to the concept of, of anti-Semitism in general, at least the way the Torah outlines it. You know, we could have neighbors that are brutish, that are uncivilized, that are unsophisticated, that are uneducated, that maybe are, are, are drunk degenerates and... Are we likely to be drawn into copying them, mimicking them, being one of them? Not so exciting. So you're saying we're more challenged now. Oh, yeah. Because we live in a society where, you know, especially up where I'm living and where I grew up, I was the only Jew and I was totally accepted. Yeah. yeah. You know, Menachem Begin, he famously said that, the, you know, the Poles, they're anti-Semites from birth. And they drink it in their mother's milk. That's what he said. And then you compare that, you know, to the Germans or to the French. People who are more sophisticated, people that are more advanced, people that are more loving. Which one of those neighbors is likely to cause us to abandon our culture, our pastimes, our principles, our Torah? The answer, of course, is, is that when we're surrounded by friends, that's when things are actually more spiritually dangerous. And similarly, a kind of a similar idea that anti-Semitism is this prophylactic against assimilation because when you don't have it, when you don't have anti-Semitism and when you have love and you have acceptance, then there's the risk of us just abandoning what we stand for and embracing everything else. And not to say that that's bad per se, but we're the Jewish nation with the chosen people and other nations are not the chosen people. And, you know, we love America. Proud to be an American, an American citizen, love the country, best country for the Jews. Great country, 
but we're Jews. We're the chosen nation. We're the nation of God. We have founding fathers that dwarf even uh, Hamilton and Washington and Franklin and, of course, Jefferson. We have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as our forefathers. If I go from being a card-carrying Jew to being just an American, it's a big loss. It's a big loss. And again, we would love for all the Gentiles to be like the Americans, but we don't want to, to lose what we stand for and to lose our own identity and to be absorbed by the rest of the nation. And I want to add one more point. I think this is maybe on a more practical level. The Ramban, in the story of, of Jacob and his brother Esav, Jacob, of course, has to flee from his brother, and then he has to come back, and he's worried about, you know, what's going to be with this encounter when he finally meets his brother again. So the Ramban says this is the prototype, the best example of how to relate to the Gentiles. What does he do? He tries to bribe. He tries to cajole. He gives money. He sends compliments. He's trying to avoid conflict. I think another important point of anti-Semitism is that we have to do whatever we can to be as conciliatory as possible, to not rouse the ire or the envy of the Gentiles. We don't need to walk around with bravado, with pompousness. Yes, we're the nation of God. Yes, we're the chosen people. But we could keep that between us. We don't have to rub that in the faces of everyone else. In fact, the Ramban there quotes a Midrash that says that Jacob made a mistake. He should have tried to sidestep his brother. He should have tried to ignore him, try to slip by him and make him forget about you. That's when we could flourish. The Midrash actually says that he grabbed a wild dog by its ears by even sending the message to Asaph. Just ignore him. There's nothing cowardly in avoiding conflict, in escaping. We don't need to be the ones who are making bold declarations. You know, we could change the world without being on the front pages. So I think that's another valuable, a practical Torah take on, on how to avoid anti-Semitism. Would all this feed into to the fact that the world at large is so much more critical of Israel than any other country. For sure. For sure. There's a double standard. Does, is there a way to deny that? There's a double standard. When Israel does something, it's always going to be criticized. You know, the, the United Nations always has horrific human rights abusers like China, people who put their own citizens in, in concentration camps. These are the people that are in charge of the human rights, so to speak, to condemn Israel. Uh, all the autocracies, dictatorships, totalitarian places, they all get a free pass. You know, but Israel's got to be always most scrutinized. But I think that that would be another example. Israel says, we want to be like every other nation. And what do the nations say? No, you can't be like every other nation. You're different. Yeah, it's like they're saying, we have higher expectations for you. Well, I, I don't know if they're saying that consciously. Not consciously, but that's what the message ends up being. Listen, there's no other way to explain the double standard that exists against Israel. There's no other way to explain it. Every nation that could do the most horrific things, and they don't receive a tenth of the scrutiny that Israel does. They don't. I mean, what we could say is that, you know, Israel has to say, we're not like every other nation. This is the Almighty's land. We are the Almighty's people. We have the Torah that guides us into how to behave. I would predict that the day that Israel, the state of Israel, changes their constitution and says the Torah is our constitution and the laws of the Torah are our laws, my prediction is that all the anti-Israel stuff, all the anti-Zionism stuff melts away. It's my prediction. Because that's what basically the Torah is telling us. Yeah, what it's telling us is that anti-Semitism only exists when the Jew, who's that recipient of that mistreatment, when the Jew abandons the divine mission that they were entrusted with. I can understand why half the 15,000 viewers to that video gave it a thumbs down. That's a lot to stomach for so many Jews who don't understand Torah, who are very secular. And I can understand, therefore, why it's typically those vocal Jewish groups that are coming up with causes of anti-Semitism. It's this person or that person or trying to find solutions that are all based around starting a 
stop the hate viral campaign. I understand why they would respond in that way because what the Torah is saying is that secular lifestyle needs to return back to a Torah observant lifestyle. And that's an arduous task as I can personally speak to. Listen, I'm sympathetic to that argument. I'm very sympathetic to that argument. But maybe we can make the following proposal. Let the Torah sages, let them be a charge. Give them the keys to the car for a month. See what happens. Experiment. Try things out. You know, how long have we been trying to do uh, or to resolve the problem of Semitism? For a long time. We have the Torah. The Torah is telling us the reasons why we have that. Let's experiment. Isn't it, isn't it worth a shot? Let's give it a shot. You know, I think another example, Talmud says that uh, Jewish people observe Shabbat for two weeks in a row, Messiah comes. Can we get the whole nation to say, you know what? I'm not a believer. I'm not ready for it. I don't want to accept it. All those caveats. But maybe it's worth a shot. Can we experiment it? Let's try it. You know, the Torah is pretty undefeated, you know, in its predictions. And it's withstood the test of time. Maybe it's worth considering, at least. I, I, I'm sympathetic to the argument that it's a lot to stomach. And I, I sympathize with those people who gave it a thumbs down. They don't like it. I still think it's an accurate portrayal of what the Torah tells us, what the Torah teaches us. It's not easy to stomach. It's not easy to swallow. But it's the truth. So maybe the Almighty, for one, has been training the Jewish people because since the COVID-19 outbreak, so many Jews have not driven for weeks. So they we're used to not driving. So not driving on for two Shabbos. I think, I think we've been conditioned now. So you're saying that the way to solve the coronavirus crisis is to keep Shabbos. Look, they're, they're already, Jews are already used to not driving on Shabbos now. They've been staying at home. Now we just have to figure out a way just to go without your cell phone, your iPhone for 25 hours. What do you think? What do you think the Almighty is going to do next? Just to literally forcibly unplug all our technology for 25 hours and say, and then we do all do Shabbos and it's all over. I'm not going to speculate or prognosticate. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I'm not a prophet. In fact, I work for a nonprofit organization. What do I know about anything? I don't know anything about anything. But maybe, maybe. I can see a little nudging by the Almighty pushing us towards. I did see a, a headline that some of the uh, non-kosher food establishments are running out of meat. So maybe the Almighty is withholding the non-kosher meat supply as well. I don't know. I saw that too. The pork supply is in jeopardy. So there's some divine intervention maybe involved in trying to get us back on path. Just two Shabbos. Maybe it's all, maybe the money is really nudging us. He's nudging us. It sounds like as well that the Almighty does not have expectations. Like back when I was just learning Torah to take on all the mitzvot at once. It sounds like he's even just telling us just do Shabbos twice. He doesn't say, and we'll bring about Mashiach. He doesn't say that... Well, I'm not going to be the one to say what is not obligatory. I believe that every mitzvah is obligatory upon every Jew. But I think there is a way for someone to onboard themselves, maybe a little bit slower, just so it's more effective. The Rambam says you're supposed to study nine hours of Torah a day, right? That's for a working person. So I, I don't think it's likely to yield to a success if someone says, you know what, I'm going to go from zero to nine hours a day just tomorrow. Maybe, you know, there's a way to do it slowly. My point is that I believe the way I understand things is that if the Almighty knows, like, that's where I want to go. And you're moving in that direction every day, where maybe it is just a Shabbos and, you know, slowly ad- adapting the other mitzvot, the cash root and all the other things. But if he knows that we're all moving in that direction, that's what's in our heart. I, I think that's what he expects from us, for those of us who are born in a very secular world. Absolutely. And by the way, repentance, the miracle, one of the miracles of repentance is that the Almighty looks at your trajectory and judges you not the way you are today, but if this trajectory would continue, you know, ad infinitum, where would you be at the end? And, you know, I saw a graph recently that if someone improves 1% every day, the compound interest you know, if you spread the graph out over, you know, a year or two years, it's just astronomical. Whereas if someone gets 1% worse every day, it's just terrible. Just the precipitous decline because everything compounds upon each other. You know, those are two heuristics or two ways to think about it that, A, yeah, of course, the Almighty 
understands who you are and what you are and what you can handle and where you, where you're holding and what you, where you've come from and what could be reasonably expected of you. And he takes that into account. And you're already given credit from where you're going to be, provided you're on that direction to lead there. And also the change does happen pretty, pretty quickly. So that is... I love it when I come up with some theory and you validate it, something in Torah. Always happy to help. So Rabbi, I want to thank you for clarifying for us what is the cause of anti-Semitism, what Torah says about it, what the remedy is for it, and how we can move forward as a Jewish people to remove it from the world and earn our rightful place. Thank you so much for your time today and for sharing with us your Torah knowledge. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was, again, an absolute joy. And I'm looking forward to the next time uh, to be hopefully invited back onto the Shema podcast. And I appreciate it. And I appreciate your friendship. and appreciate the audience. And thank you for listening. And thank you for having me on. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting Torch so they can continue to spread Torah wisdom to the world by making a donation at torchweb.org and clicking donate in the top right corner of the page. And if you would like to get in contact with our host with comments, suggestions for future topics of learning, or questions for him or his guest rabbis, you may email him at president at torchweb.org.